A Brush With is sponsored by Bloomberg Connects, the arts and culture app. Created by Bloomberg Philanthropies, Bloomberg Connects lets you access museums, galleries and cultural spaces around the world on demand. Download the app to access digital guides and explore a variety of content. Hello, I'm Ben Luke and welcome to a new series of A Brush With, the podcast from the art newspaper in which I talk to artists about their influences from writers to musicians, filmmakers and of course other artists and the cultural experiences that have shaped their lives and work. And in this episode, it's A Brush With Shazia Sikander, who trained in the tradition of Indo-Persian manuscript painting and has used its forms, techniques and language as a launch pad for a wide-ranging engagement with colonial and post-colonial histories, with feminism, gender and sexuality and with cultural identity and narratives around race. Working in drawing, painting, animation, video, mosaic and most recently sculpture, she's created a body of work in which existing and invented images and forms are juxtaposed to vivid and poetic effect. Technically exquisite and conceptually profound, her works have an instant impact but reward slow looking with layered narratives, references and histories. Shazi was born in 1969 in Lahore in Pakistan, where she studied at the National College of Arts in the 1980s during Mohammad Zia ul Haq's military regime. At that time, the medium was deeply unpopular among young artists, Shazi has said. She learned there from the master miniaturist Bashir Ahmad and eventually became the first woman to teach in the miniature painting department at the college. Her breakthrough early work, made in the final year of her BA at the NCA, was called The Scroll, made in 1989 and 1990. More than a meter and a half wide, it pictures Shazia herself in a complex domestic and garden space evoking the home in which she grew up. She appears at multiple points across the painting in keeping with what's known as continuous narrative, a device common in South Asian and Persian art but also in Western Renaissance storytelling. And while the scroll directly refers to Persian Safavid styles, it also makes reference to 20th century Western artists as we'll hear. Having achieved huge success in Lahore with this work, Shazia moved to the United States in 1993 to pursue an MFA at the Rhode Island School of Design, or RISD. There, she was among a group of students who have gone on to be hugely influential artists, including Kara Walker and a former guest on a brush with Julie Meritu. While at RISD and in the following years, Shazia loosened her style but maintained a close engagement with manuscript painting, often fragmenting or veiling its forms as an act of subversion or deconstruction. In Separate Working Things 1 from 1993 to 1995, for instance, she painstakingly rendered a classic image of lovers on horseback in Indian painting and covered it with liquid forms evoking the rays of a sun or flames. Here, Shazia sought to shatter the trope of ideal love in the Indian painting vernacular, making the picture a site of rupture and of destabilisation. It was at this point in her career that several forms that have been repeated in her work began to appear, like a female figure she describes as self-rooted, with long, protuberant forms emerging from her arms and feet. The potency of this form has been reiterated in recent months as versions of the figures with braided hair resembling goat's horns have been made into the golden bronze sculptures called Now and Witness, both made in 2023. Now, which stands on a lotus flower, is installed on the Appellate Division Courthouse in New York and acts as a startling rejoinder to the otherwise all-male figures on the building. Witness has a dome-like skirt with the word Hava, meaning air or atmosphere in Urdu and Eve in Arabic and Hebrew, written in calligraphic script in mosaic across it. It was first installed in the Madison Square Park Conservancy in New York and then moved to the University of Houston where an anti-abortion group absurdly claimed that the work promotes satanic imagery. In series through the 1990s and into the new millennium, like Unrooted Order and Extraordinary Realities, Shazia deepened her radical engagement with historic South Asian and Persian art, finding increasingly imaginative ways to imbue them with contemporary subject matter. She gave the female figures of manuscript painting new agency in making Radha, the goddess and lover of the Hindu god Krishna, a defiant and independent figure, for instance. She also began increasingly to work with forms that seemed to flock or even infest the surfaces of her painting. In Gopi Crisis from 2001, she pictures numerous gopis, the female devotees of Krishna, while surrounding them with black calligraphic forms that resemble birds or bats. In fact, they're the detached hair of the gopis, which have since become a symbol that murmurates across Shazia's work. She's used them with extraordinary power in the animations that she began making in 2001, which used the sense of movement that had become so integral to her painting and drawings to dramatic effect, often projected on vast screens. 
Still, the space particular to manuscript painting has been at the core of many of these works, like Parallax from 2013 and Disruption as Rapture from 2016. But in projecting the animations on a room-filling scale, Shazi has allowed her viewers to inhabit these environments and be engulfed by them in new ways, making her forms and themes all the more visceral. As she's expanded her language into ever more media, she's been able to create all the more startling juxtapositions. Her recent sculpture, Promiscuous Intimacies, features two entangled forms, one of which evokes the sculptural language of classical Greece, albeit in a pose directly referring to the famous Venus by the Italian mannerist painter Bronzino, and the other which directly refers to the Devata, the 11th century Indian celestial dancer once in the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, but now restituted to India. For me, this sculpture perfectly embodies Bodies Shazia's concern with evolving hybrids of cultural forms and of artistic languages, which were effortlessly fused in both her themes and materials. And it's this with which I began the conversation I had with Shazia ahead of a major survey of her work opening in Venice in April 2024. Why, I asked, is hybridity such a powerful force in her work? Well, as a visual artist, you know, I always want to look at multiple vantage points, which does make me aware of of the disparate things around me or become cognizant of, of boundaries or points or binaries or the center margin or the hierarchies, right? So there is this always this pendulum. And I'm interested in the in-between space often where multiple unexpected relationships can be created, especially between languages. So I would argue that it's not hybrid, (laughs) that it's probably more of this juxtaposition that sparks possibly new ways of thinking or entering the work or ideas that when you like align them, you know, in different relationships, it allows you to think about things in a different way, which may not necessarily be just seen as hybrid. In that sense, how does your work relate to collage, would you say? Because thinking through your work, I'm not aware of large chunks of it being collage. I'm imagining lots of forms which are distinct and come together in extremely kind of productive juxtaposition. But is there any actual collage? I guess the vocabulary is there. I'm interested in looking back and sort of mining things and looking forward. So there is this sort of engagement with material, with ideas, with languages that can be reassembled in different ways over time. Even like the shift from painting to sculptures really sparked from wanting to make a sculpture of a very particular painting, which was censored 20 plus years ago. So in that sense, I would say, I, I don't know if you can think of that as a collage, perhaps in a very broad sense. Yeah, indeed. But one of the things that you do so powerfully, I think, is to fuse the images which you are taking from distinct reference points with a kind of personal language so that you will have these wonderful meetings of fluid kind of brushwork, for instance, with a much more static image, which you've taken directly from a source. And it seems to me that there's a lot of productive tension in a sort of looseness and then a, a sort of quite in focus element in other areas of the work? At all times, I'm like always thinking about how can art remain valid, especially over time, but then also how can it go across language or histories or geographies, but like where's the crux, where's the power that lies in a particular image? And I think in that sense, when I'm thinking about art in that way, I'm thinking about time or how you can create different experiences of time. And also how, you know, our beliefs are tied to knowledge production or cultural production. Like, what does that mean? And I think if one is casting a very broad net in terms of references and ideas and languages, then there's bound to be things that will remain in focus and things which will not be that much in focus. And there's that tension in thought, but tension also in the materiality. So... I always think of like diving deep into the language, almost like an analytical manner before I can really speak to it or from within. 
and sort of that type of deconstruction that has to happen from within and not sort of an effect applied from outside. That's really powerful because it seems to me that you studying manuscript painting in Pakistan originally is such a weapon for deconstruction, if you like, that having the mastery of those techniques has allowed you an incredible freedom with which to address that material and what it might mean today. I guess we are always dealing with this tension between freedom and confinement. (laughs) I think of like that experience in a very particular phase, uh, especially as a young individual, I think, to be working 12, 14, sometimes 18 hours a day. It just went against your body or your mind, which would race at a faster speed Everything, you know, in that time as a young adult or even like late teens, I was forcing my body to behave and think and be different. And that work, the early work, especially the scroll, like I don't think I would be able to make that even if I was, again, a 19-year-old in this time and age. Like the time works very differently. I think like the 18 hours spent daily working on something that absorbed all that type of labor over two years. I don't think that time exists anymore. You said something which I thought was really striking about Scroll, about bringing the personal into manuscript painting. Can you say something a bit more about that? What do you mean by bringing the personal into it? Well, I think even in that painting, the female is an outlier. And I guess it was emerging then. It's sort of this young woman, which is stepping over a threshold, which is very much symbolized in the architecture of that piece. And she's taking herself and the viewer into a journey, which I am thinking of more like an epic poem. Her form is moving through these very hyper detailed, but very luminous sort of spaces. And the references are plenty from Safavid paintings to Polaroid photography to Chinese scrolls. And, but that young adult female body sort of defies space in a different way than some of the other characters in the work that are anchored in space differently. When I think and see who she is becoming, it's sort of this elastic, transparent, morphing form, kind of a ghost-like character. And I see that continuing later, even in one of her recent works where I worked with Snapchat to create a lens where that sculpture, which is on the top of the courthouse, could be experienced in the virtual space in an interactive manner. So I was thinking like, isn't that has a parallel to that ghost-like character that was in the early, early works? That's so interesting. And that speaks a lot to the way that forms reoccur in your work and the way that there are through lines, reappearing spectres, if you like, that occur in the work. When you're making work, how consciously are you saying this is a work in which that particular element of my art can reappear. To what extent are you juggling those forms? It's almost like a lexicon of forms that you're, you're pulling on and pulling into the work every now and again. So I'm, I'm curious about how that process works. I guess when I'm thinking about how to center women's narratives, right? How to sort of think about how women would like to tell their stories, right? Then I can think very broadly and very precisely simultaneously. And that perhaps is sort of a thread that runs through and through the work. So in that sense, I'm very aware that it is a theme that I keep returning to, but I'm not trying to repeat it. But because I'm anchoring that idea, I guess it's something that is innate. It's not very conscious, but I'm aware of like the tension between women, women in power, for example, or like the notion of the female, you know, in terms of literature or art, poetry, how it continues to have all these multiple facets, but the idea of the immense or the vulnerable or the fecund, or the monstrous, or the abject, right? There's always this lurking fear when around this idea of the female and its relationship with power, or how it can enter power, or what happens when power and women collide, or the boundaries melt. Like that marker is really important for me, and because it sort of exposes the fear that often lurks. And I think that's something that I enjoy conceptualizing and imagining again and again, because 
it's a topic that persists. And I think in that sense, coming back to what you're saying, that that's perhaps a theme that I enjoy. But interestingly, even within the feminist space, there is a sense in which your work is a critique, because I read that you said that you were responding to the inability to locate brown South Asian representation in the feminist space in 1990s art history books. So there are all sorts of ways in which your work addresses power and cultures of power, even within particular political or social spaces, right? Well, at that time, of course, in the 1990s, if you think about art history and books, third world feminism was just a very limiting kind of a monolithic category. And uh, it does point out, at least at that time, the white feminism's very blind spots and exclusions. So you know, being a young artist and being in a school in the, in the West and not having any representations where you could see yourself represented one became very acutely aware that, okay, how do you create these sort of juxtapositions that will open up new discourse? So even reading, say, Bell Hooks, and I loved Bell Hooks' work, but at that time, I know it, it was centered in African-American experience, but some of the stories, I could like hijack them and apply them and think through them. But you had to do all the work. The onus was always on you. You did the extra work. You explained where you were from, who you were, what your work was. And that burden, I think, was much more extreme, obviously, before internet and all of that. <laughs> I wanted to explore flocking and murmuration and the repeated form that appears within the individual works. Are these a metaphorical space for you. I mean, they are extraordinarily rich scenes through the work. They appear in these wonderful flocks across the drawings and so on, and the animations. Tell me what they mean for you and to what extent are they a metaphor first, if you like? Well, I guess movement in general, movement in the work, and of course in the animation it's much more pronounced, but movement for me is both uh, real and symbolic, but it's also thinking drawing, like the elasticity of drawing. Drawing is something that can have velocity, have direction, has a sense of purpose, is something that is very intimate and can be a connecting tissue with different languages. Like thinking about drawing as a libretto allows me to work with the composer in much more exciting ways, but also thinking about how symbolic literal notion of movement exists, whether it's the crossover between gender or man and nature or plant and animals or geometry or bodies. It's this space which can exist in the in-between, right? That can persist between the binaries. I think that for me is very exciting because in animating the drawings, I'm also able to locate something fresh and new, maybe things that are then about the mystery or the untranslatable. And that idea, I guess, becomes incredibly generative and movement sort of allows to explore that space. And of course, it can't help but illustrate to a certain degree or, or to evoke the idea of the movement of people. And it seems to me that that's a strain, again, that was there right at the start and continues in the work today. Yeah, I think even in the works for Venice, there is this work called Migrant Love, where the protagonists are, again, coming from all this vocabulary that exists in the work, but there's a little twist there. They are self-rooted, but they're autonomous. And then it's also not a solo figure, but like, multiple figures that are connected to each other. And I think for me, that's also about the movement and existence of people across borders. And when I was making that, I was aware that I'm like citing all the sort of iconographies, but pushing them to come up with something fresh, a fresh iteration, a different iteration. And so in that sense, I think the ethos of the work is there but it can take new forms. And I push for that. I'm always imagining how to create a different form. And in, in this work, I think some of the work was literally coming out of working with fiber and fabric and um, water and making sort of these pulp paintings. And the form emerges out of the experience of like working with different pulps and different cotton fiber, banana leaf, abaca that have different like material tension but there's no adhesive and you're just working with 
the particles of that against water. And that tension kind of shaped the forms differently. And I also wanted to ask about the intersectional nature of the work, because your work does address a whole raft of subjects and themes and so on. But one of the core themes, which I think is relatively underexplored in the literature around your work, is the climate emergency and particularly extraction and this form that reappears, which is called a Christmas tree, I believe, bizarrely, but it's based on an oil rig. Tell us about that. (laughs) Yes, I guess the conical shape of the form, but also I think it came about when I was working on a film, Parallax, which was in 2013. And I think earlier also I was looking at just sort of power in the time of East India Company, which I guess exercised across sort of different nations, boundaries, you know, that sort of network of corporations and uh, whether they're supranational institutions, but like how empire is expressed by this very transnational ideology of global privatization. So it was coming back to images that dealt with that, where we are talking about movement of resources. And I think I was looking through British Petroleum magazines of the 1960s and came across the oil rig, but it was called a Christmas tree. And maybe I hadn't yet Googled (laughs) what a Christmas tree or the oil rig link was, but apparently it was. And I thought of that and I was also thinking like maybe that's the British wit, like humor in there about the gift bearing sentiment of the Christmas tree. But (laughs) (laughs) So I made them in three dimension and then they become like a, a recurring motif in parallax. And then I think in that sense, the idea of the Christmas tree is sort of lurking in that symbol. And there's a painting called Shroud, and it becomes a kind of shrouded figure in two-dimensional works as well, doesn't it? So Oil and Poppies is another one. Yeah. So there's a whole group of works where this figure appears, and it does actually have a kind of almost a human form, as well as this kind of structure that you've talked about. I guess, yes, I think that's very true, because for me, it's like these all these themes are very cyclical, you know. They are also connected to legacies of colonial legacies, also the idea of extractive symbols, things that are extractive in nature. And, you know, how do you push back at that? What is a counter narrative to that? And I kept thinking about what could be the counter narrative and how do you define something which may be extractive in nature? Like what form does it take? And I think that theme runs through and through in my work also. One grew up with a Afghan war in the backyard, right? Like there's so much of war about, again, the reckoning with that, how I seek sort of radical feminist thought poets that offer sometimes counter narratives to hyper-masculinized histories and spaces. So I think all of these are percolating, <laughs> And how can you imagine, like, what's the protagonist if it's a proactive, intelligent, you know, playful, but also connected to the past in incredibly imaginative ways? So thinking in those ways, I think I'm often thinking about ink and gouache and water simultaneously, while all of these ideas seem to percolate. Let's move on to the questions that we ask all our guests. Who was the first artist whose work you loved? Well, (laughs) you know, I did a children's book and I was thinking in there I had mentioned that I was very interested in Michelangelo. So I think I became aware of Michelangelo probably in the Catholic school that I went to. Mm. Maybe one of the nuns had shared, but it had stuck with me because we shared the same birthday. (laughs) That's probably the very first artist, if you're talking about the very, very first artist that one was looking at. And were you surrounded by art at home as a child? Did you have art around you? So in a way, did Michelangelo stand out in a way against what was around you on a daily basis? Or was it a natural kind of language to encounter on a daily basis? Oh, no, there was no art around at that time. You know, the art was really in basically everyday experience of being and making and thinking and running around and being creative in nature, access to nature, all such things were 
present, but in terms of like access to museums or, or the rituals of going to and seeing museums, etc., that didn't exist. Right. And I think that probably this idea of like drawing or the ability to kind of move into different spaces of imagination through drawing. So I think uh, Michelangelo stood out in terms of the draftsmanship yeah. that perhaps I think was, you know, in, in the school, which was very much focused on rote learning. So I think like looking at examples of another artist's work or like looking at things and then learning to draw from that. Maybe very early memory I have is I was a very quiet child and I lived in a multi-generation family with lots of cousins around with lots of aunts everybody lived in one house and I used to do all the art homework for everybody ah. and, <laughs> and I enjoyed it <laughs> so I think there's that history too that wanting to make art or art was a means of communication especially for somebody who was very sort of quiet that's so interesting and you said haven't you that, that, that drawing remains absolutely at the forefront of your work we might be familiar with animation and video works in mosaic and glass and so on and these extraordinary sculptures that you've just been making recently but drawing is at the fundament of it all yeah drawing is like this wonderful space where you can you know it's just i feel it's like alive and moving and it's not static. I think of drawing as such, and I can equate it to larger issues like societies or histories. Societies, no histories are not one dimensional. So in that sense, when I think of like the possibilities that are within the space of drawing, I think of it as a thinking tool also. And, you know, from doing like art homework for cousins, whether it was geography maps or detailed portraits of friends that I found like maybe emotional freedom in that visual expression. It was always a tool of communication. And I've loved that, that idea that that's what gravitated me to art as a child. How lovely. Which historical artist do you turn to the most today? Oh, I, since I've been spending more time last couple of years, you know, a lot of visits to <laughs> Venice, but Carpaccio's, mm. especially the St. Ursula series, I love those. Utterly <laughs> transformational, aren't they? That is, it's such a transcendent experience seeing them and that sort of level of detail and the incredible episodic nature of it and the, yeah. the way that narrative is so richly told within the context of those works. It must appeal to you tremendously in that sense. Yeah, absolutely. I think looking at so much of the Renaissance work and then understanding like similar periods of manuscript painting traditions that are, you know, in South Asia. And just often I get frustrated at the silos in art history in terms of keeping things very polarized. And I, as a visual artist, you know, I can be an art historian and with a lot more freedom and try to imagine who was influencing whom. And it's not necessarily always the West that was influencing the East, but also thinking like, you know, if attributions were made to particular painters, you know, especially in manuscript painting traditions where mostly artists are not necessarily known mm. and attributions are made by Western, mostly male scholars. So I was like, how come there were no women? And how come, you know, this particular, say, example of Farouk Jela, also in the same time as perhaps El Greco and looking at both and thinking like, what if they were lovers? <laughs> <laughs> what if they knew each other? Like, you know, so taking the liberty and that point of departure to sort of like counter the very siloed nature of how we think about the foundation of art history. So I, I enjoy that. I look for details and information and I see that there's so much in there that is echoed across Persia, across China, across um, any other culture, especially when you're looking at like things, you know, in details in so much of this work. So, mm. so yeah, so Carapaccio offers a lot of that for me, that sort of integration and questioning and freedom. And th I think that part is really exciting, especially in terms of Venice, you know, where traces of this cultural trade are boundless and they exist and they are evident on so many different things, not just in the, in the paintings, but in frescoes and architecture, textiles, they're integrated. And that's what I was like gravitating towards. And that, again, comes back to that in-between space, right? The space between the migrant or the citizen or the material and the imaginary or whether it's the real 
or the mythic, right? And then that is the human and water as well. And that in-between space becomes very fecund. And I was, when I was there and looking at such work, but that's also what I was thinking and channeling, <laughs> perhaps in terms of the kinship systems between race, culture, experience, consciousness. Yeah. And I think those are like broad themes, but those are the themes that are close to my heart. And I think in there, if I think of those themes and then I think about centering women's narratives in these uneven power relations or these ongoing legacies of colonialism, then that somehow returns me back to the consistent theme in my work. So that's how I was thinking, like, you know, a parallel, like taking this exhibition to Venice made sense. And really emblematic of what you've just been talking about is this sculpture, Promiscuous Intimacies, which you've made, which really illustrates in this incredibly direct, but also deeply poetic way, the connection between East and West, in quotes. And tell us about that work, because there are clear references to art history in it, in the sense that there's the Devata from the Met and one sees Bronzino's Venus. But also, it's really striking to me that you based the sculpture on actual models, real people, as it were. So tell us about how you made that and, and what you were trying to do there. That sculpture really, if you look at the foundation, the Greco-Roman foundation in Western art history, but then also how like there is a relationship between Greek and India. And so often we don't think in that route. So that was my first impulse was like how to look at that relationship, geographical also, but also understand what this entanglement is and what are these promiscuous intimacies of these multiple times, right? The art historical traditions, whether they are the subjectivities and the bodies and the desires. But like these intertwined female bodies, they also carry that symbolic weight of the archetypes, the female archetypes. There's the Devata, but there's also the Venus. And I was provoking multiple ways of looking at this work, whether kind of how to imagine a very different past or a very different future, because it's always changing, right? Our understanding of culture, identity, tradition is not static. As I said earlier, it's like unstable. It's always moving. And even in this sculpture, I basically took a detail out of a painting I had made in my 20s. Which was called Intimacy, is that right? So that was just called Intimacy. Intimacy, yeah. And and I think it was all like this idea of wanting to do sculpture. (laughs) It's so interesting how it came about because I was looking at my work after 25 years. It was a survey exhibition which opened at the Morgan Library, but it was organized by the... Rhode Island School of Design's museum. And I saw so much of my work, actually most of it for the first time since it had left. And there was a sense of sadness. I'm sure all artists go through that, but I think it was also an acute awareness of being such a token representation in the sense that so much of the work was in great institutions, but not once had I ever seen any of my work ever displayed. It had just like been purchased for literally under $500. <laughs> Even then I was like, oh my God, I was like, it was so ridiculous to understand all of that and see like, okay, and then what did it do with it? It was just sitting in storage. It was also this awareness that works on paper often are subjected to that, right? Like they exist inside or they have to be whatever, put away from sunlight, but still. So it was this thing that, okay, maybe none of this work I will see again in my lifetime. And it was just this really overwhelming sense of like how to take the ethos of that work or look for the ideas that were very vibrant and put them out in a manner that could bypass the restrictions of institutions or where you find yourself as a token representation often. So that's when I was like, I have to make a sculpture. (laughs) (laughs) But going back to the the sculpture, as well as the form that it takes, it's intriguing that you didn't just look at the sculptures on which you based the work. You also wanted to work with live models. Is that right? Yes, because I was looking at a two-dimensional, two-inch detail in my drawing. And I had to make sure that it it was possible, that it was legible as a stance. 
So I had to work with a friend of mine and also another person that they brought in who's like this very agile dancer. And we were very shocked, all of us, that the suggestion of that posture was actually quite possible. I just had to sort of like put a cushion under one of the female's (laughs) body just to make the whole thing happen. But it was really great. And then I think taking photographs and understanding all the details, the tension of the hand pulling at the necklace or the foot being cupped under the other hand. But like this sort of movement of the two figures was captured with live models and then also went to study the sculpture, which since then has been returned by the Met to India. But that was interesting. It was such a kind of a poster child for South Asian collections at the Met. Like even 20 plus years ago, I was like, oh, this looks as if it has suspect provenance. (laughs) (laughs) That was me in 1999. Anyway, (laughs) I felt like, oh, it took like so long for them to catch up. Like they had to return it in 2023. Anyway, (laughs) but I just want to express that I think in such broad ways, And I think all artists do. It's an intuitive sense of working also. So then it was made in in clay and bronze. But I was looking at, you know, Chola bronzes and also like metal casting has such a long history in South Asia Mm. with this idea of the sacred tangible objects, which also intersect in ways which are functional and essential and connect with human activity and socioeconomic practices. All of these things play a role. It's not just like, here's the drawing and it needs to be just produced in 3D. I was like also thinking about the inherent function and within South Asian sculptural practices and South Asian sculpture. So I love like studying sculpture to think about drawing. Like drawing needs to have that immense possibility or suggestion of space. But then also for the patina, I was thinking how I would color it. So how to think about color or, you know, painted statuary that was classical painted statuary was not necessarily lily white as often constructed over time, but how I could inject a kind of palette that is operable in my paintings and bring that, like literally painted the patina in ways in which to capture that. But when you think of, again, like discussions on color in classical sculpture, how it links the issue of classicism with American monuments and memorials, how they are revered as symbols of patriotism in their very classicism aesthetic. So that's also like, how do you shift that or create some kind of a instability there? A Brush With is sponsored by Bloomberg Connects, the arts and culture app. The free app offers access to close to 400 cultural organisations through a single download, with new guides being added regularly. Recent additions to the app include Planet Word, the Immersive Language Museum in Washington, D.C., and the Whitney Museum of American Art in New York. Among the guides on Bloomberg Connects are numerous museums and galleries where Shazia Sikander has had solo exhibitions, including the Morgan Library and Museum in New York and the Aga Khan Museum in Toronto, Canada. You will also find this Cincinnati Art Museum in Ohio in the US, which is co-organising Shazia's Venice Biennale exhibition, opening in April 2024, and will present a version of it in Cincinnati in 2025. If you download the guide to the Cincinnati Art Museum, you can read about its latest exhibitions, including Whitfield Lovell, Passages, which has in-depth audio content on the installations, assemblages and drawings in the show, and the museum's remarkable collection. To explore digital guides to all the partnering institutions, download the app today. It's available from the App Store and Google Play, and you can keep up to date by following Bloomberg Connects on Facebook, X formerly known as Twitter, and Instagram. Which contemporary artist do you most admire? So, like, of course, in my generation, I love Kara Walker, because mm. I think we also overlapped in school. So there's a, a sense of closeness to people that, you know, that you knew, that you've seen grow, that you probably were always borrowing or learning from and vice versa. But Eva Hesse, Mm -hmm. I think, was also somebody that I loved because I was looking at like how women that were injecting sort of a soulfulness and minimalism. And I was Mm -hmm. thinking how like, you know, looking at the manuscript painting tradition, which is often 
presented as such a male-dominated space. How does the feminine enter that? So, yeah. So did you bring some of the lessons you learned from looking at Eva Hesse into the materiality of your two-dimensional work then? Absolutely. I think some of my works, like the ones that were done on these very impermanent, fragile or like large tissue paper works with mm. drawings, like I think I was thinking about the materiality there, but I was also thinking about how that shift happens in something which is so engaged in a male dynamic and what is the feminist lens it affects at different levels it's happening in the materiality also it's happening not just in the iconographies but also in terms of like kind of a organic use of material so yes I was thinking about that too when you talked about the polaroid photography in relation to the scroll I know that you've mentioned David Hockney in relation to that so was it those particular polaroid works by David Hockney that you were thinking of in relation to that work? You know, if you go back to the 1980s in Pakistan, there's no internet and books are limited. You have whatever circulating in the library or like hmm. faculty that's gone to London or come back and has given books around. So, so obviously, I think there is a limitation there. So Hockney aside, but I was also looking at artists like Hockney or Howard Hodgkin, mm. that themselves had looked at manuscript paintings, but somehow their interest or their engagement with the traditions which were non-Westerns were often sidelined. They are not the first thing you read about. So I was like always like, why isn't that at the forefront? Because it's quite clear that they are looking at Chinese scroll paintings. They are looking at manuscript paintings and they're borrowing from there but it might be like hidden in in the last paragraph somewhere in a token <laughs> line yeah. so that's what I want to clarify that that's what I was looking like I was looking at artists that looked at traditions and visual languages that didn't sit comfortably in the western art history lab right yeah and why the problematics I think like even in looking at the manuscript traditions it's more that the traditions are vast. There's no one way of understanding them. But often the scholarship around them was limiting. The 19th, 20th century scholarship was often descriptive and uninteresting or often casting them as unintelligent works. That's right. It's, it's always Indian miniatures yeah. in a kind of extremely narrow term, which doesn't acknowledge so many of the complexities of that term for a start because of and its colonial origins and so on, but also just... To call it Indian miniatures is, is, is deeply reductive, isn't it? Of course it is. And then also the dispersion of it. And then if you look at the archives, they are mostly in West. And then if you think about that history, the legacy of that history, how so much of that work is not necessarily available to the global South, to mm. the students in South Asia. Of course, now things are available and you can find high resolution images and many Many institutions are committed to providing all of that data free, but in my time, you didn't have access to that material either. So that idea is also like the provenance is very important when I think about these collections or the notion of the archives or how collectors over the years have continued to cannibalize these historical manuscripts and, you know, how they are cut out or how they are dispersed for a sense of profit. But it diminishes the potency and the wholeness of these illustrated worlds. And that, what does it mean for an artist wanting to dig in that direction? How do you develop a reciprocity with that past? You know, that's what I often kind of seek. It's not this, oh, this is tradition. Who determines what is tradition in that scale of tradition is not static either, you know. So these are many multiple things related to this idea of the manuscript. What do you have pinned to the studio wall? I have been reading this incredible book called The Benefits of Not Remembering by Scott Small. And I have a studio currently at the Zuckerman Institute of Brain, Mind and Behavior. And so there's a lot of neuroscientists and everybody, different aesthetics. Everybody's coming down to study the brain. So I have a lot of, uh, not technically on the studio wall, but in my sort of vision board, 
I'm thinking really about memory, like why memory forsakes us, right? Mm -hmm. Because I think like as an immigrant, memory is survival. And so like just thinking about that, like I'm very excited. I kind of want to develop a work there, but it's neuroscience, it's neurobiology, it's psychology, it's brain study which focuses on forgetting, like forgetting as not a failure of our minds, but actually it's good for us. It's a required function to flourish artistically. So in there, he talks about his time with John Cage, but also Daniel Kahneman. And that was so exciting because Daniel Kahneman actually came to see my work. So I was super excited to read on that, <laughs> the decision maker and like basically talking about optical illusions and cognitive illusions. So I'm really charged with that because I think if you think about how we think about ideas or why we make the decisions we make, it's all sort of related in our space, in the hippocampi, like where memory is stored or where we are responsible for emotional processing, where our behavior or social cognition, all of these things, how we consolidate new memories, how we move forward, how we go backward to move forward. Like when I think of that, then I'm like, oh, that's like a template for how I behave. <laughs> so that's sort of where I'm thinking right now in terms of like connecting that to the passageway of immigrants or, you know, this idea of how people carry their roots where they go. God, I can't wait to see that body of work. Look forward to that. Which museum or gallery do you visit the most? Well, I would say the Academia Gallery. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> has been in recent past, but also I think recently the Cleveland Museum has an incredible Asian collection. I often uh, go to the Met. You know, even if I can like consistently go see one artwork and, and that's it and not try to overload myself, like things of that nature. Do you do that a lot? Will you make a specific visit because you want to see one thing and sort of spend some time with it and then take that back with you to the studio effectively? Absolutely. I started doing that several years ago. I was like, otherwise it was always like, oh, I missed that show, so I have to go see that show. But then I was like, oh, I should just try to start the day with that, like mm. go see one thing and do it regularly and consistently. So there's a deliberate shift. But it really speaks to that fact that you've alluded to so many times already in this conversation that the materiality of the work is so linked to the concept of the work. The two are utterly inextricable, which is not always the case for artists, but certainly with you, you can't divorce the two things. For me, you know, like even working with material or looking at material or uh, learning new materials, like it's just part and parcel of working as an artist. You find ways in which that material speaks to you. Like, as I mentioned, like that one story about why I had to do sculpture, but like working with movement and animation, etc. like thinking about the pixel as a parallel to the unit of a mosaic allowed me to think about mosaics very differently. Like I usually make the mosaics by making the drawings, animating the drawings, and then taking a still from the animated drawing. So there's movement and then thinking other ways in which I can make the mosaic less static. Which cultural experience changed the way you see the world? My early teens in Mogadishu. Mm. My father was there. He took a job there in the early 80s. That was my first time outside of Pakistan and also in another culture altogether, but also another Muslim culture and seeing how different it could be. There was no one way of defining what it meant to be growing up in a Muslim culture. There were so many variations on it, but I also remember like, the impact of nature that I had. And this is obviously, this is a Mogadishu in a different time before the war and famine, but I do think that really had a huge impact. It's fascinating because so often, the, again, in the kind of literature around your work, it's always Pakistan, the US, and those two things are the kind of defining parameters very rich cultural parameters of your work, but experience in Somalia, I saw that in your biography and I was amazed. So yeah, it's so fascinating to know. Do you think, was there visual information you gathered in that time that has stayed with you? Somalia, I think was my first exposure to other societies and how they were like dealing with their colonial baggage. It was also first time looking at water, being in proximity to water. Mm. So that had a huge impact. And also it was such a 
sort of matriarchal culture. There were lots of strong women. And the history of poetry there, I think, resonated with me over the years, much later when I was able to understand more like that Somalia has produced fantastic poets. And I wanted to understand that more in terms of women and their role there. And I think separating the Muslimness in South Asia, like South Asia, the cultural rituals are such, which are not necessarily, you inherit them as cultural rituals, but they may be separate from the Muslimness. And the Muslimness in Africa was a very different set of cultural behavior. So I think those things were had an impact on me as a young teenager. But later, like, gravitating to poets like Warsan Shaya and also even Kenan, I was like, oh, I really can appreciate what the young poets are doing or the lyrics in young hip-hop artists that are refugees and that are tapping into their history and into their broader cultural history of being from Somalia. I couldn't appreciate them in a different manner. And that's a good segue into the next question, which is, which writers and poets do you return to the most? I return to a lot of people, but I think poets in particular, young poets, for example, Solmaz Sharif, Love Her Work, Audre Lorde, Perrine Shakir, Adrian Rich also. I kind of look at works of these poets from different perspectives. So Adrian Rich, for example, translated Ghalib, mm. but like that aspect of her practice may not necessarily be known. And in fact, I had pulled out her translation on one of Ghalib's poems, which is, Shedding tears of blood is no game, a strong heart, a steady nerve are wanted. I'm too old for an inner wildness, when the violence of the world is all around me. Like that's Adrian Rich speaking to a poem by Ghalib. So I I kind of like that. I like Seeking things and then discovering that, you know, that this particular project of introducing Ghalib to an American audience through a series of American poets was interesting too. You actually painted a portrait of Adrian Rich, didn't you? Which is among a group of other portraits. And among them were other poets and writers like Franz Fanon and so on. Yeah. What did you want to specifically <laughs> depict those people? Those are the people that I think I've read a lot. Mm. That was really the reason. I was like tapping into their work. So not making literal portraits, Mm. but portraits that were symbolic of the relationship I had cast with them. And I think it was just an exercise for myself. And there's Fatima Mernisi in there as well. Which music or other audio do you listen to while working? So I was just finishing some work and actually it's all like pulp, but I had injected like this gold color into the Mm. cotton pulp and and actually we had like gold dust woman (laughs) in the background, Fleetwood Max. (laughs) That was so much fun, but that made me think that I had Sabri Brothers on repeat when I was making the scroll. That was awesome. Like, oh my God, like at that age, just like Sabri Brothers on repeat. Then when I was making the painting, The World is Yours, The World is Mine, I think I had basically done a PhD on Nasser Jones' work. I I was not that familiar with rap, but I literally listened to all of his work. Then I reached out to him and I was able to have an interview with him an unpublished interview in my archives, but I don't necessarily listen to music in the background when I'm making art. But if there is a direct link, then it becomes really important. If anything in the background, it would be probably maybe some form of jazz. Mm. I like Sudanese jazz. Sharbi Lamad is a really amazing Sudanese musician that I listen to. And of course, other people like Aretha Franklin, Etta James, you know, many wonderful musicians. One of the striking elements of your animations is the music by Du Yun. And I'd like to know to what extent 
you work with do you in ahead of completing the animation or to what extent do you hand over the animation and say do what you can with this and give very direct instructions at that point to what extent is the collaboration one that's there from the start of the project if you like I think I'm really proud of my collaborative histories and relationships with the people that I collaborate with. They are really driven by giving attention and time, and they are built on that premise that attention is really critical to developing trust, and that foundation of trust has led to the work. So we will travel together, we will develop work together, ideas things are shared, like, you know, you're investing in a relationship. It's really built from all of that. It's not like, okay, here I have created a piece and now I need somebody to score the sound on top of the work. It comes about more organically over a period of time. So, yeah, she's privy to my ideas and, you know, her texting, talking, traveling, we maybe she was in Shanghai, I visited Pakistan, and she came over. We ran around, met some people, recorded some things. That was some years ago. Some years later, we were like, oh, look at that recording. That made sense now. So, But I don't think that I would be able to have that type of relationships with just about every collaborative direction. But I tend to work very closely with other people so that I learn their language, they learn mine, but the autonomy of our languages can coexist in the work we make. So oftentimes there's a lot of freedom for the collaborator in terms of how they exist in the work. And I think that I'm very excited about that, that that for me is really a, a very empowering collaboration and not just in terms of just the idea of it. Is there a particular discipline in your daily working life that you see as an essential ritual? Yeah, walking. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, walk a lot everywhere. I take extra time to get somewhere. I don't know, I think it clears my head, but there are examples in which it has led to works. And one of the ones that I love to share is that I would never have thought of like doing a art project in Times Square. But when I was walking in that area at night, oftentimes I would wonder, and I, at that time I wasn't aware that the Times Square Arts Alliance offered this program. And then that led to reaching out, putting a proposal and ended up doing like a piece over 90 billboards in Times Square. That came about by literally just walking at night in New York. Actually, the courthouse was similar. Like I would look up and I was aware that there was an empty spot on the roof of the courthouse for, for a couple of years before the Madison Square Park project came about. But other ritual is I love teaching. I am very involved with young artists. Oftentimes people reach out to me on social media and I do classes that are free for anybody. I, I take out a day or time and then people can reach out from all parts of the world and we talk. They share their work. And I think that became very accentuated during the COVID years. But I do that. You mentioned the work on the courthouse there. One of the things that all the attention on this work has obscured to a certain degree is, is the fact that this is an enduring image in your work. This self-rooted, this figure with these self-nourishing roots has appeared in your work since 1993. And it's an extraordinary thing to see now having such a public attention. Yeah, but I think that proves my point, no? Then like <laughs> the, maybe like the sculpture was able to take that work and put it into a very different social sort of space. And I was very excited to see that it was connected to a painting from the 90s. Mm -hmm. And I had literally just taken that painting and made it into a sculpture. But that particular painting was also censored. I was doing a mural in 1999, 2000, and in there were multiple images, but it was at a law firm. And one of the images I was looking at was the representation of power of law, just often through a female, but often white. And I was looking at that history and wanted to sort of address it from another feminist perspective, which was not necessarily coming from Western art history. So by shifting just that, and looking at the headless, multiple-armed figure post 9-11, they suddenly had issues with that image. And I was asked to remove it. 
And I decided to just remove myself from the commission. And then, you know, it was lying in storage. And one PhD student was like, we should pull some of this work out and tell the stories around it. And I think I was like, oh, I, can I do that? <laughs> I was like, oh, it's not complete. <laughs> it was like, no, take it out. And so once we put it out and started sharing the stories, so it was in the uh, sort of 90s focused retrospective that mm. I had. And I was like, oh, I'm going to take that painting and make that into a sculpture and see what happens. And that's where what you're referencing is that the appendages do suggest that self-rootedness, you know, which for me, has always been about the immigrants, like how they carry their roots wherever they go. It's not about women and nature. They are not a reference to tree roots. But no matter how much I see that, oftentimes I read that everywhere. It's like this sort of like, oh, that's women and nature, which again is a cliche that often people return to. But for me, the self-rootedness is a symbol of the immigrants. And But it's also about women's resilience and autonomy and, you know, women's sovereignty, perhaps, or the questioning of the fallacy of assimilation versus foreigners. And yes, it's amazing how much it has upset at people. But, you know, her hair is also, it's her braids yeah. that do resemble the two ram's horns. But they are symbols that are present in the New York Appellate Courthouse. <laughs> All I did was take motives from the courthouse. They are all over in their decorative program. They are on the judges' bench chairs, on the arms, the rams and their horns. They are on the front frieze of the facade of the courthouse. So all I did was I took those and then kind of played with them. But I was also drawing from the syncretic visual histories of, of Africa, Asia. I cite the Nigerian crest moss. And also these very beautiful spiraling, like snail shell, like hair curls that often adorn Buddha's head. And then, you know, so it's not Medusa. No, it really isn't. If you could live with just one work of art, what would it be? Oh, the Pachanama. I would love to borrow the Bachanama from the Royal Trust Library that they have in Windsor Castle. That work is, oh. Who wouldn't want to live with that? No. Like, I would love to live with that. It's absolutely exquisite. And lastly, what is art for? Oh, for me, art is many things. Art is wonder. But I found this beautiful, it's one of my favorite poets also, is Kave Akbar and his book, Pilgrim Bell. And in there, he talks about art as something that art is where what we survive, survives. And I was like, oh, that's really powerful and brings me back to my interest in poets. Well, Shazia, thank you so much. Thank you, Ben. This is great. Shazia Sikander, Collective Behaviour, is at the Palazzo Van Axel in Venice from the 20th of April to the 20th of October. It then travels to the Cincinnati Art Museum in Ohio in the US from the 14th of February to the 4th of May 2025 and is simultaneously at the Cleveland Museum of Art in Ohio in the US also from the 14th of February but until the 8th of June 2025. Shazia's project Haver to Breathe Air Life is at the University of Houston in Texas in the US until the 31st of October this year. Shazia also features in the exhibition Entangled Past, 1768 to Now, Art, Colonialism and Change at the Royal Academy of Arts in London until the 28th of April 2024. And that's it for this episode. Please subscribe to A Brush With wherever you're listening and do give us a rating or review on Apple Podcasts. Do also subscribe to our sister podcast, The Week in Art, a deep dive into the latest big art world stories, the top shows and the key issues every week. And please subscribe to The Art Newspaper at theartnewspaper.com. We're on X, formerly known as Twitter, at Tan Audio, and on Facebook, Instagram and Threads. Production, editing and sound design on A Brush With by David Clack. And the producer is Lewis Jeb. Thanks also to Daniela Hathaway. A big thank you to Shazia Sikander. We'll see you next week. Bye for now. A Brush With is sponsored by Bloomberg Connects. Download Bloomberg Connects today and discover cultural institutions on demand. <laughs>